Stansgate is today's representation of a society dissatisfied and full of disillusionment, unable to really enjoy the present because lives exclusively chasing the future or the past. Or in other words, when Okabe finally notices he hasn't talked with Mayuri for quite some time, you really want to be right there and tell him, duh, maybe that's because you used that wacky time travel microwave to win the third lottery prize, Mr. Not So Much Mad and Absolutely Not Scientist. No, 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 no. I can't start like this for a masterpiece like Stansgate. Stansgate doesn't deserve that. And it's something smart and philosophical. Something in the style of. Alan Watts. There's an old wives' tale with a lot of truth in it. Whenever you meet a ghost, don't run away. Because the ghost will capture the substance of your fear and materialize itself out of your own substance and will kill you eventually because it will take over all your own vitality. So then, whenever confronted with a ghost, walk straight into it and it will disappear. Stansgate is the animation of a sci-fi, time-travel-based visual novel that doesn't need to run after ghosts. But ironically, its protagonist must do it. Okabe never stands still for a second, never shuts up for a second, and never stops thinking for a second. If he isn't annoying Kurizu, he's tricking Mayuri and Rukaku with his false conspiracy theories. If he's not thinking about the time machine, he's working on the time machine. And if he isn't changing the past, he's running away from the future, until he realizes he's always run towards the wrong goal, so turns and faces his ghost, just as the wise Alan Watts said. But the very act of running, either against or away from a ghost, is still a frightful act. An act that creates distress and expectation, which, condensed together, form fear. And although Stansgate isn't scary, what conveyed to me was an overwhelming anxiety, hinted by the first 12 episodes and then showed by the following 12 episodes through short and precise scenes, full of tension and suspense, very contrasting feelings compared to its usual epic lucky tone, a contrast that immediately turns into confusion when the anime seems to have completely forgotten about such scenes, as if they were all a fantasy of its eccentric protagonist. And creating genuine confusion I think is both the strongest and weakest part of the whole anime. The fact that Okabe doesn't comment those moments properly or pretend they never happened is alienating, because for 12 episodes you don't understand where the story is going, or worse, if he's actually going anywhere. So I understand why so many people find Stansgate boring just from the first episode, because it feels like watching a slice of life about time travels and scientific theories that wants to look smart for the sake of it, showing you something strange but unexplained. If you have lived under a rock since 2009 and you're watching it completely blindfolded, or if you know only its fame, then it takes a true act of faith to continue watching, because Stansgate hides a lot of things and doesn't even promise to show what you want in few episodes, but it rewards your trust, delivering a plot that is perfect from any angle you want to watch it, obviously leaving aside some minor deus ex machina. And then, when you finally get to the climax, you will probably apologize Stansgate more for using its first half as a huge build-up for the second than to have taken its damn time to show you all its cast interact with each other. And that's perhaps because the characters, although interesting and unique, aren't so important after all. The meeting between Okabe and the other future members of his lab seem completely random, and when it comes their time to shine, they're shown for a couple of episodes and then literally stop existing. They are not breathing characters like Okabe and Kurizu, but fillers, a probable legacy of its visual novel origin. But I don't feel comfortable talking about them so badly, because yes, they are narrative expedients, but not of the bad kind. Each of them interact with Okabe very differently. Mayuri understands who he really is and in fact lets him play his role of mad scientist. Daru is indifferent, Rukako really believes him, and Ferris imitates him. They have a really good complicity, which is why Okabe and Kurizu are so good together, because they are a great comic couple. Okabe loves making fun of Kurizu because she gets easily offended, while Kurizu always reacts in a very natural and sincere way, and so try to ground him, showing how much childish he is. And the fun part is that she often fails, and instead, show how much childish she also is. Seeing them bickering is truly a delight, because in spite of everything, it's obvious they care about each other. Moreover, Stansgate marginalized the problem of not really develop its characters, exploring them in a unique way only few stories can do, that is, exploiting time travels. Stansgate uses the what-if formula to show how characters will change if they have the opportunity to fulfill a wish, and subsequently their reactions when those wishes are unfulfilled. So they don't evolve, they don't come outside their comfort zone like Okabe and Kurizu, 
Shinzu, but we have a small window to observe their lives in alternative worlds, with situations and characters that can be radically different. All of this making these moments important, interesting and above all, relevant to the plot. The perfect example is Urukako. Okami reminds us since the first episode that he, despite looking like a girl, remains a boy, but what if, in another timeline, he really is a girl? It's exploring these kind of questions, the first half of Stan's Gate, and this is also why it's potentially boring. It lacks important and relevant consequences in the short time. In fact, if Rukaku really became a girl, what will change? Nothing, says Stan's Gate, just the gender of a character who already looked and acted like a girl and nothing else. This until you reach the 12th episode. Then you understand that for every action, and in this case change, there's always a reaction that usually is never pleasant to watch. There's a strong and clear indifference for all the cast that never leaves the series, but changes its shape. With the episodes, together with Okabe, we too start to see all the characters more like objects than real people. And I think Stansgate conveys this detachment first using time travels, and then Okabe himself. After all, before you knew them, but after jumping to a different timeline, you can still say the same? And this question serves nothing but to put more pressure and suffering on the shoulder of our beloved the hothead Okabe, who wants to carry the fate of the whole world alone, pain that, let's be honest, he deserves a little. Okabe is that kind of character, the classic lazy and selfish protagonist that appears almost arrogant, who hides behind a mask, in this case being a mad scientist, to justify his immense fear and indecision. It's his fault if you cannot take seriously that hallucinating trip that is the first episode, because Okabe is a hesitant fool, he's a character who needs a strong shock if he doesn't want to succumb, and Stansgate builds this shock in a very gradual, almost gentle way. It gradually tells you that what Okabe is doing isn't a joke, and the more he continues, the more risks do the same. And when he realizes that his new and exciting adventure isn't the game he thought it was, he already knows that it's too late to go back, and the bill to pay will be incredibly bitter. This is the point where the viewer literally switches with Okabe. If before you were running from episode to episode because that scene must mean something, then it's Okabe that runs for you until the end of the series. Because you can only stare where you are, stunned and exhausted, looking at a fake mad scientist running incessantly like a hamster on a wheel, with nothing but the dissatisfaction of being responsible for the madness under his eyes. And you feel partially guilty for that. I really struggled to rewatch Stan's Gate because I knew what would happen, and I didn't want to rewatch it. Because it's true, Okabe is a clown who deserves a lesson, but he isn't a bad person. He really cares about his friends, and even if he doesn't show it openly, he would do everything for them. He doesn't deserve what happens to him. But Stansgate doesn't agree with you, and instead of a slap, forces Okabe to go through hell itself, trapping him in situations that become increasingly more impossible as he tries to redeem himself. It's a real torture to watch, and by then you regret the first carefree and insipid episodes in which nothing new happened but also nothing bad either. So all you want is just to run with Okabe towards the finish line, hoping for a happy ending. And the ending is what makes Tensgate the masterpiece it is. It isn't given to you on a civil platter because Okabe is the protagonist, but is earned literally with blood, tears and sweat. Watching the last episode is conquering the top of a mountain that before seemed unsurmountable, or complete a puzzle impossible to complete. It is restorative, energizing and incredibly satisfying. And when you look back and remember what Okabe had to do in order to be in that exact spot and that exact moment, you realize that he is really a hero, even if he has nothing heroic but his incredible determination. Determination and having a bunch of flaws are his only superpowers and what makes him one of the most enjoyable and beloved protagonists of anime. Many stories like to represent their protagonists like perfect, immaculate and powerful heroes of justice, and those are the stories that I dislike the most. I think this approach lacks realism and depth, because nobody is perfect, and reminding viewers that you are not alone in making mistakes, I think it's something very important. But that doesn't mean those stories are bad, or that it's wrong to design certain characters. Even I like watching, for example, Marvel movies when I want to watch something with my friends, or immerse myself in a power fantasy because it's cool to see superheroes doing super stuff. And Stansgate is the perfect meeting of these two realities. Okabe is both the hero of everybody and the hero of nobody, so much so that he doesn't care about saving the world because it's the right thing to do, but only because he wants his friends to be safe. In particular, a very, very special friend. It's this attitude what makes the most famous mad scientist of all time, Ho in Kyoma, a protagonist full of dramatic irony. Because once he crossed the point of no return, he can no longer have what he's always had, but only what he never really wanted. After all, saying that you are a mad scientist wanted by an evil agency doesn't mean that you really want that. But if this became reality, you can't hide anymore, and have to accept it whether you want it or not. And obviously Okape didn't want that. 
Sensegate, in its second half, becomes how it will feel to live inside the head of someone who truly believes in conspiracy theories, and therefore to feel like a tiny pawn on a chessboard too big to be seen by your miserable and inefficient eyes. And conveying this existential anxiety isn't exactly cosmic horror in a nutshell. When I was in university, at a management of the building site lecture, our professor told us that 94% of all working days would have been just normal. Bad things would have happened and good things would have happened, and that's fine. Anyone can manage those days, but it's the other 6% that we should have been afraid of, because the 3% would have been just wonderful. No surprise expectation, no harder workers, no slowdowns, all perfect. But what would have shown ourselves to be real professionists would have been to face the other 3%, the one in which, whatever you do, nothing will end up fine. Where materials delivered late and damaged, where probably it would snow in August just to make you late on deadlines. I can't give you real advices, he told us, so be afraid, because the only thing you can do is try and limit the damage, clench your teeth and resist the pressure, something that you can learn from books. The essence of cosmic horror is to be stuck in that 3% where everything can only go to bad to worse and nobody cares about it. But talking more generally, cosmic horror is a branch of the horror genre created by H.P. Lovecraft, a man that doesn't need an introduction, as an evolution of the gothic and romantic horror of Edgar Allan Poe, combined with the existential nihilism explored by the philosopher Nietzsche and his existential gang. <laughs> Although Lovecraft is remembered and associated with the figure of Cthulhu, using gelatinous monsters and indecipherable tentacular aberrations is not a prerogative to write a good cosmic horror story. In fact, Lovecraft didn't really care about those monsters at all, unlike his friends, that expanded it themselves his pantheon of terrible ancestral gods. For him, they were only a mean to convey something bigger and more frightening, something easily recognizable even in his often forgotten collection of short stories the will to represent a blind but terribly curious humanity. Lovecraft's intention was to instill a personal existential fear, a fear that each of us must feel at some point in life, and manage to get it throwing down humanity from the pedestal on which it is, asking uncomfortable questions. What if there is something far greater than us that we cannot see? What if our innumerable achievements in technology, society and medicine are nothing compared to the mysteries segregated in the forbidden ocean depths, the awareness of being a grain of sand in the desert, an insignificant being that isn't able to do anything to change his uselessness. This is the focus of Lovecraft's stories and from where its terror arises. If I have to think about a modern interpretation of Lovecraft's cosmic horror, I would instantly name Welcome to the NHK and Stansgate for very different reasons. Essentially because they both share the theme of conspiracies, they can easily replace the mortal giants of Lovecraft's stories, because they have the same ideology and motivation. The fact that there is something hidden from the eyes of everyone, like the Illuminati or the Reptilians. But above all, because Welcome to the NHK is a brutal representation of the protagonist's fear, while Stansgate has the identical narrative structure of Lovecraft's works. Think about it for a second. A mad scientist casually builds a time machine and, guided by curiosity, uses it to discover a terrible, hidden truth that makes everything go to shit like classic Lovecraftian endings. But what distinguishes both titles from Lovecraft's stories is precisely the ending, because they don't want to show how humanity is impotent and miserable, but rather that there's always a light in the darkness. And this also applies to the more pessimistic Welcome to the NHK and Stansgate Zero, where Okabe literally loses his determination and resigns to his defeat. Many people succeeded in imitating the existential atmospheres of Lovecraft, but something no one ever managed to replicate is his ability to blend together the grotesque with the elegant and create an harmonious but terrifying style. Lovecraft wrote in a stoic but elegant way, often making use of words not his use, embellishing abomination with a really nothing elegant that can be easily embellished. And I think Stansgate does something very similar, but in his own way. He shows situations that are grotesque and absurd, but with characters that look like perfect, anorexic, almost scary porcelain dolls, something very evident in the visual novel character design. In fact, they need just a little lighting change to make even the most innocent of girls something disturbing and alienating to look at. ReZero, in this regard, is another excellent example. Even if he doesn't show his characters in an elegant way, he uses a common and banal style to create situations that are the opposite of common and banal, going beyond grotesque into something that could be considered brutal, gratuitous violence. And that's exactly where good horror comes from, injustice and senselessness. But even if both ReZero and Stansgate have harrowing scenes, one more than the other, no one considered them scary despite having all the elements to be scary. The motivation is the same for why writers like Lovecraft and Edgar Allan Poe hardly scared nowadays. Because there's wars. 
Video games are undisputed champions when it comes to conveying strong feelings, because they are the only medium that forces you actually to do something. It's more easy to identify yourself in a protagonist you can control and spend dozens of hours with, compared to something you can interact with like an anime or worse, a book. Once, Lovecraft and Edgar Allan Poe were really able to terrify, because video games and televisions did not exist. Cinema wasn't fully developed, and anyway, without the internet you wouldn't have had access to endless options. The only way to experience something scary was to read a book and imagine it. In fact, Lovecraft's monstrosities are never described in details, but they are deliberately nebulous, although vivid and real, leaving room for the reader's imagination to complete the picture, something that, in our days, is not very effective anymore. For those who haven't lived in the era of the first PlayStation or, like me, didn't have the opportunity to play masterpieces like Final Fantasy VII, it's really difficult to feel something for strange cubes with a vague human shape now, when everything tried to strike for realism. That's why remakes and reboots are a necessary evil in today's culture. It's a bully act to replacing your version of the game, the one you remember and love, with something that's intrinsically different, but it's also an excellent way to let new generation experience something similar to what you loved. In an era like ours, where there is nothing really new, imagination is replaced with realism and simplicity and elegance with what's strange and modern. In fact, in recent years, we have seen the explosion of video games such as Undertale, Pony Island and Doki Doki Literature Club, video games that convey fear and anxiety, questioning the very nature of video games and the role of the player in them. While returning to anime, we had Evangelion, Medaka Box, Madoka Magic and ReZero that try to mix cliches in something new. And this my long ass rambling, even if Stansgate isn't spooky, takes us in front of a very spooky question. Simple stories like Stansgate have a place in today's modern market? And my answer is a boring and very anticlimactic yes. Obviously yes. Why shouldn't they? In fact, I find it easier to imagine the opposite. The more time progresses, the more stories like Evangelion will have less and less place in our market, because nobody will be interested in a commentary on the mecha genre, while Stansgate will not suffer from the same problem. After all, it's just the story of a time travel gone bad and really nothing else. And the proof is a certain trilogy that reminds me a lot of Stansgate, that is still considered a must watch even 30 years in the future. But to motivate how this trilogy succeeded, and why Stansgate has all the credentials to do it, we must first understand understand the historical period of his publication, I'm talking about the magical 80s. The power of love is really a curious thing, so much so that if it wasn't for an explosion of that love in the 80s, our passions would be completely different from what we have today. In fact, for anyone who didn't live in those years as myself, the only way to understand them is to use the magic time machine called the internet and watch, read and listen to anything popular back then. After all, art is always the manifestation of people's feeling in a given historical, political and social period of time, and a glance is enough to understand why the decade is considered one of the most influential in any field. Those born after the advent of the atomic bombs found themselves in a world in which it was no longer possible to believe in anything or anyone. The same science and technology that once made humanity great now created something that could destroy anyone and everything in seconds. Mankind realized realized he had killed God, took his place and shitted his pants. Something had to be done, and quickly. This is why in the 80s everything was tried, explored and changed, because old meant obsolete and wrong, new rules, fashions and passions were born and established and those things became something we now refer to as unforgettable classics. People from the 80s lived the success of Guns N' Roses, Van Halen, Queen, and songs like Living on a Prayer, Beat It, and Absolute Meme by the legend himself, Rick Astley. In the 80s there was the birth of video games, the anime boom, and the publication of my favorite book ever, Misery by Stephen King. And also there was the birth of films such as Terminator, Blues Brothers, The Breakfast Club and, of course, Back to the Future. And all these unforgettable classics have survived the test of time not only because they represent a different era from today, but thanks to their enormous simplicity and desire to not take themselves seriously. I mean, who dance like Michael Jackson in Thriller nowadays, or wear strange clothes and funny hairstyles? And funny here is the key word we need, 
because everyone can complain about how bad was the music, about how video games were junky and inaccurate, or about how movies were too slow. But on the other hand, everyone can appreciate something simple, funny and carefree, even if it doesn't meet today's standards. It's also inherently funny to see how the world changed so much in such a short period of time, and that's why I wasn't surprised when I found Back to the Future as the main inspiration for Stansgate, because they share a simple and immediate plot, bizarre gadgets and the main way to go back in time. After all, the famous D-Mails used by Okabe were named in honor of the famous DeLorean. But what they could never have imagined was that, among all three, they chose the worst of the trilogy. Yeah, I understand why. Stansgate's time travel mechanic is practically the same as the Back to the Future Part 2 one, but they are more connected in a spiritual way, starting exactly for how time travel works. Any story that wants to deal with time travel must follow very precise rules that must be explained to the viewer in a clear and inequivocal way. And Stansgate's rules are not simple, but are explained with efficient metaphors that makes them simple to get. In fact, isn't a problem following the complicated speech between Okabe and Kurizu about the time machine, also because the anime follows rules that are never broken. That's what I really appreciated by the first Back to the Future. It's simple, clear and self-conclusive. There was no problem understanding something because the only rule was change something the past and will also change the future, while part 2 does nothing but complicate everything for the sake of doing so, without adding anything important. It is literally a filler of an hour and a half, with only task of being the bridge to the next film and its moral. But this bridge, despite founding on solid grounds, takes you only in front of a canyon named Ending of Part 3, filled with uncomfortable questions about what actually can change the present thanks to Doc and his fucking flying time travel train. Errors and inaccuracies, however, don't undermine that incredible and hilarious adventure that is the entire trilogy of Back to the Future, remaining current even 30 years in the future because it doesn't want to be anything but itself. In fact, despite having heavily disliked the ending, I was literally on the edge of my seat during the final scenes of part 3, and part 2 remains very enjoyable despite being narratively useless, because there is always time for a story that wants to be pure entertainment and nothing else. Stansgate, to me, seems the evolution and maturation of Back to the Future, which, just like its inspiration, wants to be just a story about time travel, friendship, determination and nothing else. And that's probably why such a niche story is at the moment the fourth best anime ever on my anime list, because it won't represent the year in which it was created like Back to the Future, a thing we'll only discover 30 or 40 years in the future, but just like it, can be appreciated by anyone because simplicity is never obsolete. There is no other anime like Stansgate. There's Raised and ReZero, but both want to eat a very precise niche of people. ReZero, for example, has a very playful and fun time travel mechanic. Well, only for viewers, certainly not for Subaru. <laughs> Poor thing. But it's an isekai, and as such, if you don't like fantasy with magic and battles, you probably won't like it. Furthermore, it isn't finished. Many things remain unexplained, and this can easily be a determinated factor to not watch it, despite being very solid. And I've already said it, but I think it's very important to underline it. Stan's Gate is unique. There's no other story to compare it to. And that's why I painfully rewatched it several times before writing this video. Because even if I know every single scene, even if I know all the motivations and characters' action, I... I wasn't able to find its message. But that's not really true. Through Akabe's action you can understand that, with determination you can get what you want, but Stansgate never uses this message as its flag. Usually, there's always a moment where the line between characters and writers doesn't exist anymore, and from there, you can clearly see what the story is all about. Stansgate doesn't have that moment, and it doesn't need one. In fact, you can understand why watching the film Lord Region of Deja Vu. In addition to seeming a very bad fanfiction of the original series, unlike this one, there is this moment where you have literally the writer in front of you repeating a stupid message which you don't care. Hell, I know that I can't change the past because otherwise I would have already done so and now I wouldn't be. Here. And Stansgate isn't this. It doesn't take its scientific theories and possible messages and slam them in your face to show you how smart it is, like until dawn and its damn butterfly effect. It's harassing, annoying, and serves nothing but to spoil your enjoyment. After watching the movie, I didn't care anymore. I simply wanted to rewatch the original series again, again, and again. And the sensation of finishing an amazing series that always makes you feel good isn't the most beautiful message of all? 
Alan Watts once said that it's stupid to say that we don't have time because we can't be aware of the present. That's why the ends of our watch are so thin as they are consistent with visibility, because we are temporal beings, forced to live constantly in the future regretting the past, whether we want it or not. After all, time's not gonna stop without us. That's why movies jump from one action scene to another, or why haiku, a form of Japanese poetry created to encapsulate a moment in its simplicity, no longer exist. Because in our society we can no longer stop to smell the roses, we can't stop to observe a beautiful landscape. We can't just stop anymore. Time is money, and time always flows too fast to have the convenience of stopping and thinking for a second. But Stansgate is not a haiku. It doesn't need to chase a moment in the eternity of existence to stay current. Because even if you don't have time, just like Okabe and his friends, there will never be a wrong time to experience the masterpiece that is Stansgate. And, you know, there's only one right way to end this. L. Sai Congeri? <laughs> <laughs>